Welcome, Johan Hartmann. Uh, sounds like he's one of those uh, unlucky people who has to work for himself. Uh, <laughs> and he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, doing stuff with Python to help you to do stuff with Python, if I understand it right. More or less. Sorry, I'm just having a fight with a mouse on the slope. There we go. Are there any souls still sneaking in? <laughs> right. Thank you for being here. Thank um, the team for the opportunity to speak at PyCon Z8 2018. Um, this is my first PyCon. This is yeah. Yes. Okay. So we should give them a couple of minutes. We'll do that. It'll give me time to settle my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Advertisements? Um, I can do advertisements for myself. At what? <laughs> Another one. True. No problem, thank you. I'm not very photogenic anyway, so whatever you get is good enough. So are we waiting for the flood or maybe not? <laughs> Um, I can do my talk a little bit shorter. There isn't another talk after this one on the schedule. I don't know. Hey, eh? there is now. Okay, cool. I can do my talk a little bit shorter. No problem. I can still stop at what two. Still a long queue. Okay. I'm happy standing here saying nothing. Okay, you can give me the signal, I think. <laughs> okay. When I was timing myself, I did it in 25 minutes, so even if we start 10 minutes late, I can still hopefully do it okay.
Right, hello again. <laughs> we, we started and now we're going to start again. So uh, please welcome Johan Hartmann. Take it away, Johan. I'm not going to say Thanks. more. <laughs> um, well, I'm starting. <laughs> thank you all for being here and thank you to the PyCon ZA 2018 team for letting me speak. It's my first time attending PyCon, and it's my first time speaking, so be gentle. Um, my intent with my talk is really not to address any dark corner of Python at all. So I'll warn you if there's code coming up. My intent with the talk really is to give you a motivation to think about writing your own automation tools, maybe your own code generation tools, and I'm going to try and motivate you to do that by showing myself as an example. Um, it's the wrong screen. If you want some details on me, you can go have a look at those links. I am an electronic engineer by trade, not a programmer at all, not an IT person at all. So take what I say with a grain of salt. I believe everything started here. That's me. <laughs> Playing in the dirt, having a lot of fun with it, under an old lemon tree, I believe. And never at that age could I have imagined how important that stuff could become in all of our lives, my life, your life. Um, dirt. I'm just going to start my timer. Doesn't want to start. So, yeah, when I was small, you would never caught, catch me in the house. Always outside, always playing, building, breaking something, rain or sunshine. And um, a little bit into primary school, I started reading a lot. And soon, if you asked me, I would answer that I want to be an inventor when I grow up, not a fireman or a policeman. Um, Going into early high school, I started getting in touch with electronics a lot. And I liked the stuff a lot. It was interesting. And lo and behold, after school, I started electronic engineering at Tux. So the end of the story, this little bit of the story, is that I'm still playing with dirt. Just a cleaner, more sophisticated form of it. Um, and by the way, that's what all of you are doing as well. Playing with silicon every day, just with lots of layers of abstraction in between. Um, if you look at that picture, it's a, a photomicrograph of an Atmel embedded processor. It's something I've used in a lot of embedded systems designs. And since we are in the graveyard shift, and I don't want to lose you already, let's take a quick detour into my world. That's the typical work I do. I do product design from inception, documentation, specification, doing a design at chip level, laying out PCBs, doing firmware for the embedded processor, doing some software on the PC side, to make my job a little bit easier. So if we take a look at that, and we zoom in on the embedded processor, that thing over there, sorry, it looks like that. Not that interesting if you're not an electronic engineer. But taking an x-ray of it, it looks like that. And in my world, that's that could actually be quite important. Um, if you're buying a gray component, you may buy something with all the markings on it, but with no silicon inside. And that has actually happened on very expensive chips. Um, you could be buying a end of life chip where one of those tiny little wires over there, a bonding wire could be missing. And that chip should have ended up in a skip. Instead, it ended up on the back of a truck. So 
useful image to be able to look at. Stripping off all the plastic and taking microscope slides of it, you can explore it and in this case you'll find the name of the chip embedded in the silicon, 6502 variant. It's a nephew or a niece or whatever you want to call it to the 6510 processor that was in my first computer, a Commodore 64, just for interest sake. Um, and then all of this I have to attribute to silicon porn. There. So that's my, that's my job. And since I'm working for myself, that's my day job and my night job. <laughs> uh, somebody is understanding. Um, developing something like that, you should notice immediately that some of the things that you assume to be available in your life is not there. On this example, there's no Ethernet port. There's no screen, there's no keyboard. This one has LEDs, but I've done some where there's not even an LED on it. So the big challenge is um, how do you find efficient ways of assisting yourself in your development of an embedded system? Um, and the immediate answer is you should use a debug system with a JTAG port and so forth, and you can run through your code and hit a breakpoint and stop. And if that board is driving like the magnetic flux ve vector in a motor, the magnetic flux vector in a motor or a transformer, if you hit the breakpoint, you very likely break something in the physical world that this thing is controlling. So you really can't use your normal tools of code debugging. Um, you have to find ways of doing that without interrupting the code flow. It has to keep going. Um, the next challenge is, in embedded systems, we live in a different world. If you run out of resources, you buy a bigger machine. I've done many, many projects where that processor over there has 4 to 8K of code space and 512 bytes of RAM, and that's all you're ever going to have. You have to do everything you need to do in that code space. This processor, by the way, could run Python, circuit Python. It's an ARM processor, 32-bit, half a meg of flash, and 160 kilobytes of SRAM. That's loads of space <laughs> in my world. You probably can't start your favorite DLL in it. So, how do we go about debugging and developing efficiently with this thing? And I just need to swap screens for a moment. Right. So, looking at that, <coughs> the, the easiest way is maybe to go to the next screen and to look at this picture. I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of a model view controller. If I can explain what I do on the embedded side in terms of a model view controller, it might look like this. You have analog to digital converters, sensors, inputs, interrupts, serial ports, feeding information into objects or C structures in the real world. And you have a tightly time coupled process feeding information into your objects. The eight Objects might be state information, it might be configuration, it might be debug information. And then you have something that's taking a view on those objects, generating some sort of action, um, controlling a motor, controlling the temperature level of a fridge or something like that, and generating some communications for you, possibly. If you start thinking about the idea that you can map all the information that you want to access, for instance, the header of a linked list can be an object. Um, the control structure controlling how 
an A to D converter convert a real world value into some physical um, measurement like a voltage or a temperature. The control structures that your transfer algorithm needs can be mapped into an object. So you get the idea that if you think about it in this way, objects can play a crucial role in your whole development cycle. Um, so, what I've done for myself over, I think, the last 10 years or so, is developed some tooling that works for me for my process flow. Um, on the embedded side, I'm sure you've caught on by now that I use C as a development language. It's very efficient. It can work in very limited resource spaces and so on. However, going back to this picture, yeah. going back to this picture, I need external tooling to help me work in that software environment. And as I've explained, if I wrapped, wrap all my in information in terms of objects, all I need to do is have a capability to serialize those objects onto a COM port like a serial port, a USB CDC port, an Ethernet port, and I can bring that information over to the PC side. But my focus of work is here. I don't really want to work a lot on the PC side. The PC side is just a tool, an enabler. So how did I go about this whole story? I should have warned you, code. What I do is, when I start a project right at the inception, I write in an XML definition form a definition for every object that I'm going to use. And if you look over here, you can see that I have something that I call message objects or control objects or state objects. This is just a single example of them. Um, the thing has got a name, an instance name, an index into the protocol that it's part of and so forth. And those are just the, the things that help me identify it in a serialized stream. The object is, ex itself contains fields for every element it needs to encompass. And I have things like enums that, although it's a numbered index in C, in Python it can be a list of names. Um, and as an example, what we have here is we have the A to D converter calibration structure. So we have a number of A to D channels that we want to identify with names where possible. Um, we have, for each field, we have a type, we have a name, we have an indication whether it should be displayed on the PC side or not, whether it should be editable or not, its units, its number of elements if it's an array, uh, a, default, a default value, a min value, a max value, um, a description if you display it on a screen, and some options. In this case, an enum has a number of options. And I have defined all the types I use in the C environment in this way, which makes it possible to do this. On the embedded si C side, I can generate namespaces in the form of enum declarations. Why do you want that is that you having that actually makes it possible for your modern code editors to do code completion for you and helping you holding your hand, not making mistakes. I can generate um, C structures, which is the object definition in C. I can generate function prototypes and I can generate template functions for instance for receiving this thing from a serialized stream or packing it into a serial stream whether you serialize it on a serial port, an ethernet port or whatever. So this can actually do a lot of typing for me. This all looks deceptively simple at 
this stage of the game. On the other side, oh, what I want to say as well is that I have made my methodology of work basically to map the, the format of the C structure in memory directly into how I transport data in my serialized stream. And for that, decoding that, I use the Python struct function to unpack and pack the data. On the Python side, um, my complete approach is to write programs that operate on object definitions, which means the whole program is data-driven, not function-driven, um, which means that the code I've been developing over the last 10 years I reuse completely as is for the next project. I just pull in the new data model definition. So to look at the Python object definition, it looks something roughly like this. There's a protocol name that identifies it in the serial stream, a protocol ID number, a message name for the decoding, a message ID, whether it's generated for being transmitted or received, and then all the elements of the object, once again with um, default values, types, names, range definitions, and so forth. Going to the next screen, I have an element count that helps my encoder decoder on the serialization. I generate the format string for uh, the Python struct library, and then I put some empty instances in there for last receive time, last receive instance, and last display instance. And what that enables me is to have a program that looks like that, that I don't write a new line of code for, for every new project. Um, the display uh, view on this side is simply automatically generated from the object definition. There's some coding around it. Um, there's a tree view to access the elements in um, protocols and messages and so forth. But, yeah, that's very useful to me because my focus is on the embedded side. I don't want to do a lot of coding on the PC side all the time. And because I have the information, enums can be handled as drop-down lists of names instead of just one, two, three, four. Um, bit fields can be handled like that, and it makes your data objects very visible, very accessible for debugging and so forth. As an example, you can use your display view of a specific um, structure or object or message type fill in some va va variables, send it via the debug interface oops, to a serial port, for instance. On the way to the serial port, um, it goes to the encoder, it goes through the encoder decoder, where I log the binary format of it, and a fully decoded um, human readable, you can almost call it maybe a JSON view of the data. What goes over the serial port is something very minimal, just the binary data encapsulated into a, a transport protocol. Right? And it works the same way in the reverse. You can do things like write a graph display where you can select the object and some elements from the object and do graphing on it. You can use the same principles and use a TCP server if you want to handle many, many connections to many embedded systems at the same time. The TCP server becomes a nice thing to use. I've used async IO to write a TCP server that can handle many, many connections. And going back to this handling screen over here, you can select the TCP client and do messaging with it as you like. Moving on from here, I have a default program set up that I don't have to rewrite all the time. And here's the example that would maybe give you an idea of the utility of this. 
in this project that ran over maybe two years, it evolved over time and it got to the point where the embedded system was using more than 1,800 variables as control and state information. Those were spread out over 302 objects. If I had to sit down and write an, a view screen, an access screen for each of those objects manually, it would have been an insane job. By just importing my data model into my program, I get that for free. And it saves hours and hours of work because it's auto-generated code. There's no bugs in it. There's no misspellings in it. My debugging time comes down from an embedded system around 40% of the time down to around 5 to 10% of the time because there's just so, so much less opportunity for mistakes. Taking this idea a step further, um, I have a scripting engine where I can take one of the objects from my tree view, select it, pop it into a list, then pair that, set it up. For instance, if this object is something that you're going to be expecting from your embedded system, you can set it up with a range of valid values. You can set it up with fields whether that specific element should be checked in this specific instance as a go, no-go test and so forth. And then you pair that object with an action object. So you have in the script a list of action object and embedded object or whatever you want to call it, message. And the action object tells the program what it should do with this specific object. Should it, should it send it down to the uh, embedded system? There's timing setup that you can do. Um, there's fields for things like, if this test fails, should the test continue um, or not? Should this test be applied at that, this moment in time? And what, you, what I have at, at the end of the day is a very easily assembled uh, list of tests. And these tests, because they simply operate on objects that are streamed up and down, can do software and firmware testing, and it can also do hardware testing. I can build an embedded system where if a board is manufactured in a factory, you want to test the whole thing in complete detail, whether it's got any issues. I can use exa exactly the same system to do the factory testing. So, at the end of the day, I have a view where I can set this program up in a factory where an operator can scan a unit's serial number, load a test file, run through it, and I've made it, for instance, here, if that line is blue, it means scan the serial number, it turns green. You press run, the, run script, it starts running through the test with applying timing, field value checking, all the way down. If it finds a failure that is marked as critical, it will abort the test or it will continue down completing all of your test. So it's a factory test program for free with virtually no effort. Right, and what this has done for me as an independent single contractor, if we go back to the picture of that PCB, very often you'll find a hardware person, 10 minutes. Okay, I'm way ahead. <laughs> very often you'll find there's a hardware developer doing the PC board design. You'll find an embedded firmware software developer that writes the C code. You'll find another person, possibly an IT person, sitting on a PC writing a program to test this whole lot, to integrate it into the rest of a system or a business system. And you'll probably have a project manager or a program manager. This piece of code enables me to do all four of those jobs, not taking any more time. So for me, this is a huge enabler. So my whole purpose of my talk is this. I'm pretty sure then that in a lot of what you guys do, 
things are repetitive and structured. And that's all you need to start generating, so writing your own tools that automate your job. Something that needs to build a database with 300 tables, with uh, uh, data capture screens, with report views, with PDF report generation, all of that is the same thing over and over again. If you write a program that runs from a data object description, you can probably automate 80% of what you need to do there, I think. But then I'm an engineer, not an IT person. Um, and that's what I want to conclude with. Thinking back of my one example there, where I had 302 data objects, 302 views, translate that into a database where you have 302 tables with 1,800, 1,900 variables. Imagine the amount of work. Um, I've done that work once, and I reuse it again and again and again. And to give you some perspective, I've been operating as a sole proprietor contract engineer for the last 15 years. In those 15 years, I wasn't employed all the time, but I've done 150 projects. Um, the first ones were quite painful, but lately, <coughs> it's quite easy. Okay. And that's roughly what I want to portray. I've made my talk a bit faster because we started 10 minutes late. It looks like I'm 10 minutes early. So, any questions? We did uh, adjust the schedule a bit, so. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Jan? Uh, I think what you've done is very impressive. Uh, I just wanted to ask, as an independent contractor, building those boards that you showed look like very time-consuming exercises that you mentioned takes a lot of your, your days and sometimes evenings. How do you manage your time to still build a lot of these automated tools? Uh, tools? It's an investment I've made for myself. Um, yeah, it's just extra time that I didn't build into a project over eight, or eight to ten years where I've incrementally thought about how do I make my job go easier. Um, and I started building simp simple things. Mostly in the beginning I built uh, the code generator that generated the C code for me. And then I got the idea about the Python side um, and it evolved. So as you, st as you start something, you don't always have the view of where you will end up. And this is probably what happened here. The more I did, the more I saw I could gain from adding this little bit and that little bit. Obviously, in this talk, I've scratched the surface of what I've done. There's a lot of detail to it. And there's a lot of mm, deep detail in thinking about how your C code affects your Python code and the other way around. Working with a very capable environment like a PC, whether it be Windows, Linux, or whatever, um, you can do a lot here to make your life simpler on the um, constraint side. Should I say a little bit about the tools I've used, maybe? When I started, okay, why Python? I, in the mid-1990s, looked at, I told myself, most of what I do is C coding, but I need to learn a high-level language. And I found a study that was done in one of the American universities where they took 13, 14 languages. They got four, five, six people in each language to implement two programs. And then they did heuristics on it. They timed how long the job took, how many bugs were in the code, what was the memory footprint, what was the execution speed, the efficiency, and so forth. For me, the key thing that came from that study is this. At that stage, um, the Python people spent about four to five hours implementing the sample programs. The C++ and Java people spent 30 to 35 hours. I wanted that. That's why I learned Python. 
The tooling I used here, obviously I use um, a windowing system. At the time when I started this, it was basically WX Windows, which is WX Python at this stage, and Qt. Qt was owned by Trolltech. It was a commercial package, not freely available as it, was, as it is today. Um, maybe lucky, I ended up choosing WX Windows. WX Windows has very advanced features for laying out screens. Where you don't, you don't have to work, do the work in terms of a WYSIWYG tool. There are tools that automate the layout of buttons and panes and whatever. And that enabled me a lot to do the kind of thing that I did here. Um, I'm still on Python 2.7, so I've used async for the TCP server. And yeah, any other questions? Your, the first step in your process is creating that XML. How do you do that quickly? Because that looks like it could be a giant pain in the neck. Manually. Sure. That's, th that's the painful piece at this stage. Okay. Um, I could write a tool for that, but I don't see a lot of utility in that. Just okay. a lot of work. Um, mostly what happens there is you look, look at the register set of a peripheral on the embedded processor. And you reflect that register set in the XML definition. Um, other things like the control structures of threads in a real-time OS, that what, that's what goes in there. And then a lot of um, embedded debug methodologies that I've developed, I use the idea of error counters and so forth a lot in the constraint environment because you can increment an error counter from an interrupt routine without doing a time hit on the project, on the, on the upper level stuff. So debugging and a lot of my methodology of work is already captured in the XML. So I probably copy about three, four okay. protocols into every new project okay. and start the rest from there. Okay, cool. Uh, nice work. <laughs> cool. Um, when you're running your test, don't you find it difficult to do the timing from, from Python? Um, I know with embedded systems, um, quite often measuring time from like a PC is really, really difficult. Um. Measuring time on a PC is horrible. <laughs> you laugh, but measuring things like microseconds and nanoseconds in an in a embedded system is easy because you have hardware peripherals that do, do it for you. I can very, very easily flood the serial port on a PC from a much, much slower embedded processor if it's got a DMA on its serial port. Very easy. So, yes, I have to be somewhat looser about timing on the Python side, but I simply use the, the Python timer module. Um, it can do milliseconds. It's good enough. Okay. Hello. Um, the way you demonstrated um, um, this, it, uh you're making it quite more interesting, which is good, and thank you for that. Um, my question is, for someone probably who's doing more or less the same thing as you are doing, do those people have an access to your tools, or, or I mean, do you share them? I heard you spoke about using them for free. I mean, are they out there for, for, for other people to also utilize them? I expected that question. <laughs> I'm a horrible person. This is my competitive edge at this stage. As I get older and I stop doing this, I may release it into the free software world and maintain it as a hobby. But at this stage, it's my competitive edge. That's why I'm saving. Don't think about using my tool. Think about your development workflow, your process, and what of that can you automate for yourself. It makes you a more desirable programmer if you can do three people's jobs. All right, well, I first of all had an observation and then two questions. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> I'm hiding in the back here. Yeah. Uh, the observation is what you're doing here strikes me as an awful lot like DevOps, which is what we do in our world, which is essentially automate everything. So I've never really seen it done with microprocessors or embedded systems before, but I think this is awesome. Well, thank you. 
Uh, the first question is, uh, what kind of embedded system has 1,800 variables? Are you allowed to tell us? We're very curious. It's an embedded system that use four different radio technologies, uh, a GPS, and it does a number of different various interfaces to alarm systems. Okay, so it speaks many protocols. Okay, no, that makes sense. The uh, second question was, uh, in the world of embedded systems, how are things like the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino affecting you? Not at all. Let me explain why. Um, try running a Raspberry Pi from a battery for six months. Your Raspberry Pi consumes just under an amp at five volt. That's five watt. Um, five watt hours is a big battery. And you've just run it for an hour. What we typically do with the embedded processors, for a start, they consume a lot less power. They consume of the order of between 1 and 50 milliamps. So possibly 100 to 1,000 times less for a start. Then what we do, we make it intelligent. Um, an embedded system that has to run from a battery, you can configure it to run flat out and get its job done as fast as possible, then put it to sleep. In sleep mode, it will, con it will consume probably around a millionth of the power that it uses in active mode. In other words, nanoamps. Okay? And the fact of embedded processors is that it can come from sleep into active mode in microseconds. So you don't have the Linux boot process. In actual fact, your whole application with it com its complete state stays live during the sleep cycle. You cannot do that with something like a Raspberry Pi or an Odroid or a whatever. Thanks, Johan. I, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. It's always good to hear from somebody doing something that isn't world famous yet. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you very much.